Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I'm uh, very happy to see you here. And uh, uh, today you just uh, heard another nickname of mine, Little Coconut. <laughs> Only Andrew can call me that. <laughs> just kidding. Um, we're uh, finishing uh, the book of Ephesians today. And um, I feel kind of sad because I wish... Um, and there will be time again that we could just take this book and just, oh, man, just preach on every verse. <laughs> it is so rich. And I'm pretty sure that some of you, as we were going through the book of Ephesians, and it's, it, it made you question some things, and it made you read the Bible a little more and dig and, and, and just rile you up a little bit. At the same time, it gave you peace and it gave you joy. And we're going to finish... Uh, Book of Ephesians today. I think most people can uh, recall when they met a good friend, All right? Um, and how exciting it was. Some can recall the day when they met their significant other, and how their heart was racing, and how they went on that first date, and they thought this was the best thing ever. And some can recall a day when they stood at the altar and they said their I do's, thinking this is amazing, uh, walking on the clouds. What else? What's the next day going to bring, right? And some of you can recall a day when you had your firstborn. This is fun, you said. This will be fun. <laughs> We're going to be best friends. Right, you're thinking like, yes, this, this is the most amazing little human being. And yeah, we're going to love each other and we're going to like each other. And there's going to be a perfect peace and harmony. And yeah. <laughs> Remember when you got your first job? Coworkers were nice. Boss was amazing for the first week or so. <laughs> And then what happened? You dread every Sunday evening. You're like, oh, no, I got to go to work tomorrow. I hate this place, right? You got the job. You loved the job in the beginning. You loved the core co coworkers. You loved the boss. And then you're like, why do I have to work? And we blame Adam and Eve for all of this, right? It's just like, why, God? You know, why, Adam? Why did you do all of that stuff? But what happened? You loved it for the first week or so. And my answer to this is, people happened. People happen. We realize that people are not what they seem at first. The first at first, we, we got to know them. They, uh, then the more, we, the more we got to know them, the more we disliked them, or the more uh, or we were disappointed in them. So friends, they let us down, and we ended up losing some of them. Boyfriends and girlfriends hurt our feelings, so we ended up breaking up. Husbands and wives show their true colors, and that leads to hurt. Rocky marriages and often divorces. Children end up being not as fun as we imagined. We quickly realized that a bundle of joy is a bundle of self-centered narcissists we have to shape into good and likable people. And that is all true. People let us down. And we fall into that category ourselves. And sometimes we think, when we look at a person that we loved, we liked, we respected, a uh, person, uh, a, a child that we're raising, we're thinking, where did I go wrong with so-and-so? What did, what I, where did I go wrong? Where did our, our relationship go wrong? Where did this marriage go wrong? Where did this parenting go wrong? And we often get stuck there, and sometimes we just want to give up on people. Uh, like one of my pastor friends says, uh, well, ministry is great. It's the people that suck, you know, right? Just like it's the people that are horrible. Ministry is amazing. 
Uh, but it, it's just, it's, it's not very comfortable to work with people because people make our ministries harder and my, our lives harder and our workplace harder and our family. It's just like, it's, you know, we, we often think that about people. We don't think that about ourselves, though, though. You know, because my wife, maybe, I hope not, but she thinks that too, probably. <laughs> He's so fun. Right, not all the time. Right? It's just because we are fallen creatures and we tend to make a lot of mistakes and, and, and instead of focusing on uh, what's important, we begin to focus on one another. We want to fight one another. We want to give up on one another. And uh, here we have Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. It says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power and put, uh, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And, uh, man, again, I wish we could have, like, Seven more sermons in this because I would love to talk about every piece of armor of God, uh, but I'm not going to do that. In fact, I was led to do something else today. Um, it's really interesting that uh, I'll throw this main idea at you right away, and you, you'll see why I'm doing this. Satan wants to destroy the unity of the church, period. Think, get this one. Remember this one. Satan wants to destroy the unity of the church. The whole reason why this book of Ephesians was written, it was written to the church. It wasn't written to the city of Ephesians or to the council of Ephesians or to the, some judge of Ephesians, you know. No, it was written to the church in Ephesus. So it was written to the believers, all right? And that's the important thing to remember. It's important to remember. It's written to the church. And when the Word of God talks about unity, it talks to uh, the past church, to the present church, and it's talking to the future church, right? It's talking to all generations, I want you to focus on verse 11. It says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. And as I'm studying this, I'm noticing something because I thought that when I put on God's armor, I am to stand against his attacks, which that will work too. But in here specifically, it says against these strategies of the devil. It's against the strategy of the devil. You see, like my strategy, if I am at war with you, and one day maybe we'll go to a battlefield and then we'll physically hurt each other, but before that, I will have a strategy. You will have a strategy. I will think how to capture you. I will think how to defeat you. And so Paul says, Satan has a strategy on how to distort the unity of the church. How to sabotage our lives, our relationships. And so some of the strategy we're going to talk about is Satan's strategy is to destroy a good relationship. All right, what does this have anything to do, do with uh, the armor of God? Again, I'm going to talk about the armor of God a little bit later. But as we look at the letter to Ephesians, uh, it was not written in chapters. It was not written with verses. It was not with, written with commas or periods exclamation marks or question marks. And if you look at the old uh, original copy of the book of Ephesians, it's nothing but letters. There's no space. There's no paragraphs. There's just one big paper with a bunch of letters. I don't know how they used to read this stuff because I need my commas and periods and exclamation marks and stuff like that, right? But, but, but they understood it somehow, right? So at the same time, we need to understand that the whole letter was written at once and it was read at once. So there is big uh, uh, context, right? There's a context of the letter. And uh, when we preach the, uh, at church, we often like to pick a little verse here and a little verse there. And we're like, and so we like to build on that, which is, which is okay as long as you back it up with the word of God. But again, a lot of it needs context. And context is important. And it's interesting, well, last Sunday, uh, chapter 5 of Ephesians, it talks about marriage, unity in marriage between husband and wife, right? So wives 
Obey your husbands, respect your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Let that sink in, you know, love them a lot, <laughs> right? And, and, then, and then chapter 6 begins, uh, verse 1 starts with this. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother, and this is the first commandment with a promise. And then there's verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. And so these verses uh, describe or depict the relationship between parents and children. So chapter 5 talks about husband and wife, the unity in between husband and wife, the love that should be in between husband and wife, the connection that should be in between husband and wife. And then chapter 6 begins with connection between parents and their children. Children, obey your parents. Children, honor your parents. And parents, do not provoke your children to anger. Very important. That means that in the Christian household, there's disobedience and there's provoking going on. And then verse 5, it says, slaves, different type of relationship here. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Now, I can't say that we have slaves now, or nor do we have masters we have different type of relationship now, right? So slavery is abolished. But we are employees. And we have our bosses. Some of you, and in the way church, we have quite a few people who own their businesses. So some of you are bosses. And some of you are employees. Now this is written to you. Even though we can't relate to this because we have no slaves, nor do we have any answers. However, this describes the relationship between a worker and a boss in this in, in day and age. Where do you work? You're called to obey your boss and serve them as you would serve Jesus. So in verse 9, it says, Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. <laughs> what? Serve them? <laughs> what? This is, this is crazy, right? So to a slave, he says, serve your master and serve him as you would serve Christ. And to a master, he says, do the same thing. Serve my slave? And treat him as I would treat Christ? Uh, yeah. Huh. This is an interesting relationship between the slave and the master now. Uh, it puts that slavery into a completely different department now. What's going on? Hey, worker, employee, boss, employee, treat, uh, serve your, your, your boss, right? Uh, uh, treat them well, serve them, work for them as you would work for Jesus himself. Do everything you can to, to obey them and to, to meet the needs, right? And at the same time, he says, boss. You do the same for your worker. Serve them. Treat them well. Do not aggravate them, right? She says, masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. Bosses, do you treat your workers with contempt? Are you rude to them? Are you treating your believing workers as Christ. That's very interesting. So we have an example of what our family and work relationships should be like. But in the eyes of the parents, sometimes, because I'm a parent now, I can say that. My parents would probably say the same thing. A child deserves tough love. They aggravate us. They push our buttons, and then we lash out at them, right? We yell at them. We compare them. We say mean things to them. Sometimes we don't even notice that we kind of curse them, right? And, and, and in our eyes, my child deserved that because she disobeyed me or because she did what I don't like. And, and she did this and that, and so I told her, I told her, I told her, and finally I snapped, and I gave it to her. 
And the children often think that the parents deserve talking back and dishonor because they aggravate us, them. Because they lash out on them, because they are being unrealistic sometimes. And so the children push back. And the bosses often think that the worker deserves to be threatened. And the worker thinks that the boss deserves to be disobeyed. It's, a, it's an interesting circle, isn't it? And all of you can relate to that. You pushed back at your parents before because you thought they're not right. You as a parent lashed out on your child because you thought that they deserved this one. You as an employee, oh, you did not bless your, your boss because you thought he does not or she does not deserve any blessings. And you as a boss lashed out on your worker, on your employee because you thought that they're lazy. They, did, they deserve some tough love, some hardships. And you know what? I think everyone is right. Technically, we all deserve all of that nonsense. Technically, we all deserve lashing out and, 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 that, and that tough love and, and threats and, and disrespect and dishonor. We all deserve that because we are people and we are not perfect little angels. We deserve all of that stuff. But we seem to handle things wrong a lot. We seem to handle things wrong because when I think that you deserve my anger, me lashing out, that you deserve my dishonor, and that you deserve my disobedience, I, I think you're the enemy. You are the one who did this. You are the one that started this, right? Uh, confrontation between friends. She's the one that started it, so I responded. And therefore, I'm going to respond to this person in the matter they deserve. Because they keep on doing this thing over and over and over. And so I'm going to respond to them the way they're treating me. The reason why we do it wrong, because we think that the person in front of me is the enemy. I lash out on my wife, she lashes out at me because they, we think we're the enemies and so we don't recognize that the enemy is the one that puts a wedge in between us. And we see each other as the enemy. Brothers and sisters arguing with one another, they're thinking they're the enemy, but they don't realize that the enemy is standing next to them. He's the one that puts a wedge in between a relationship a co-worker and a boss, a brother and a brother, a sister and a sister, a husband and a wife, a mother and a child, father and a, and a child. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We think we are the enemies. The visual enemy is the enemy. Our second point is Satan's strategy is to shift your focus from the real enemy. Verse 12 says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirit in heavenly places. So who are we fighting against? Am I fighting against you? Is my struggle against you? Is your struggle against me? Is your struggle against your mom and dad? You can't talk to your mom, you can't talk to your dad because there's beef in, in, in between you and, and you're thinking, well, you're the enemies. You're, no, you're looking the wrong way. You're looking in the wrong direction. What the Word of God says, we are fighting the fight with the invisible enemy. You see, well, he loves to sabotage our relationships. He loves to make you think that your wife is the one, is the enemy, or your child is the enemy, or your husband is the enemy, or your coworker is the enemy, or your friend is the enemy. So he's very good at pointing fingers, and he steps aside. Someone said... Today, in the Western culture at least, our innate tendency to underestimate Satan's power. Even his presence is sometimes imagined as make-believe no more than a phantom wearing a jumpsuit and a pitchfork, a monster hiding in the closet. We made him no more than a caricature instead of a treacherous, conniving, hell-bent, pen, uh, personalized menace he truly is. And as a result, we give him room to scheme and scare at will while we run around firing off at anyone and everyone except him.
Do you see that in the family sometimes? Do you see that in church? We fire at everyone and anyone except him, except the true enemy. His strategy is just to put a wedge in between you and have you self-destruct. The real enemy is the devil. He's laughing hard every time a husband and wife fight and point finger at each other. He's standing right there and he's just laughing. <laughs> he's elated when a parent provokes a child to anger and when, the ch and when children dishonor their parents, he's happy. He's standing right there and he's enjoying the show. He rejoices when employees can't stand their Christian bosses and when Christian bosses lose their cool at their Christian and non-Christian employees. He rejoices. He loves that. He does that. He's very good at it. He's very good at it. And John 10.10 10 says, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. He is good at that. And when he succeeds in shifting my focus from him and unto you, I begin to do his work for him. I begin to destroy my relationships, my work environment, my marriage, and so on. When I take my eyes, eyes off the true enemy and begin to focus on you, I begin to destroy my own relationships. When I focus on your flaws instead of the truth, I sabotage my relationships and I watch them go in flames. And while the devil was part of that destruction, it was I who pushed the self-destruct button. Believe me, some relationships are very toxic and we should run from them. That would be a godly uh, and good decision because Bible says that bad company corrupts good morals. So if there's a toxic relationship and it's not just hurting your feelings, it's hurting your spirit, it's just like, it's destroying you, it's, 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 uh, it's abusive, run. Walk away from this one, run. If you've done everything you could, walk away, right? But all the other relationships, We need to fight for them. And to fight, we need to know who the real enemy is. To fight, we need weapons. And this is where we get into the armor of God. The armor of God works well when I focus on the real enemy. Okay, the armor of God works well when I focus on the real enemy. The armor of God does not work well when I focus on you. Actually, we tend to aggravate and hurt each other really bad when we put on their armor to go to war with one another. This is where the divisions happen, separations, you know, uh, anger, and all kinds of pain. It happens when the Christian puts on the armor of God, takes that sword, and goes to war with another Christian, and they hurt each other. The armor of God works well when they focus on the real enemy. Not every weapon is useful in battle. You can fire a rifle at a soldier but good luck with the tank. Good luck with the submarine as, uh, that shoots missiles at you. You can't even see it. A rifle is completely useless. So in order to fight an enemy, you, know, you need to know who the enemy is and you need to know which weapons to use. And so what I'm noticing is this. In order to choose a weapon, you need to know your enemy. Satan is a powerful enemy. And you need to understand that you can do nothing against him. Our tricks our smarts, our human ideas, our human strength will never, ever work against him. Ever. There is nothing that you can do in your own strength to defeat this enemy. Absolutely not. Nothing. That's why God gave us his weapons. God, God gave us his armor. We need weapons that will help. And here is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. Paul says, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness, and for shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. And in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil and put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, we have like six sermons right here, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna 
Just glide through this real quick. The belt of truth. Put on the belt of truth. Remember, we're talking about relationships here. You can use the belt of truth. You can use the armor of God in many battles. But the, but the context here is relationships. The relationships. So I can use the belt of truth, uh, truth in relationships as well. So what is the truth? It's a very interesting question. It's a very popular question. So the belt of truth is the truth about God that is in the Bible. It is the truth about men. It is the truth about our sin. It is the truth about God's righteousness. It is the truth about the cross. It is the truth about Christ's death and his resurrection. It is the whole written word of God. It is the whole written word of God. It is the truth that comes out of my fellowship with Christ. It's the belt of truth. And here's one interesting truth in the Bible that you can definitely should put on every single day. And it's in Romans 3.23. Everyone has sinned and falls short of God's glorious standard. Okay, that's the truth that I need to put on every single morning. As I get up, and as you, you usually we look at a mirror and we, we make sure that our shirts are not inside out, right? So we have no stains and stuff like that. We're looking at this mirror and we're putting on our clothes. Every morning you get up, put on this belt. The belt of truth that says everyone, not just your people that you are angry at, your family, like your wife, your kids, your friends, your co-workers. No, including yourself, everyone has sinned and everyone falls short of God's glorious standard. And that's the truth. The truth is Christ did not only die for me, but he also died for the one I'm angry with. He died for the one I'm fighting right now. He died for the one that's hurting my feelings and I want to hurt his feelings back. He died for that person as well, not just for you. And as I put this truth on, I give myself a reminder that Christ died for this sinner, the worst of them all. And through that belt of truth, I should be looking at you that God, he died for you too. He died for you too. And then there's body armor of God's righteousness. And of course, when you put the armor, you need that belt. So the belt of truth is very important. The truth of God is very important to our, uh, uh, when it comes to our righteousness. The truth is, since you have received Christ, you are saved and you are positionally holy in God's eyes. You're holy. Look, listen, you, you might have fallen last night you might have fallen today, you might have sinned, and, you, and you're thinking of yourself, I'm such a, such an evil person. Yes, you are, that's the truth, that's the truth. But you know, another truth is that God looks at you as, and he sees you as holy. He views you as holy. So uh, we're positionally holy. And what Satan's constantly telling me is that you are not worthy, and uh, you are doomed. Uh, you are not worthy of heaven. You are not worthy of his love. And it's simply, if you don't know the truth of what Christ did for you, you will believe that lie. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, So there is no condemnation, condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Period. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And I should understand that about myself. So there is no condemnation. God is not listening to any condemnation. He's not taking any of them. He's not believing any of them because I'm holy in his eyes. And Satan, he can stand before God all he wants and he will point out all the sins that I've ever done or maybe the sins that I will do and he will present them to God and God will say, holy, mine, mine, holy. And this is hard to understand. But at the same time, if God will not accept any condemning words from Satan against me, then why should he accept condemning words from me when it comes to you? There's no condemnation for those who believe, uh, belong to Christ Jesus, so I have no right to condemn or diminish those that are in Christ Jesus as well. I have no right. 
You have no right. And so as I'm putting on this armor in the morning again, I put the belt of truth, all right, I know how that salvation works and I know how God views at me. At the same time, I know the truth that as a believer, I know how God views you too. And so therefore, I cannot blemish that righteousness. I can't. Put that on. Put that on against the devil himself and put that on when you're in a relationship. When you're at home, when you're with your kids, when you're working, put that on. Because Christ died for them and Christ views them as holy just as he views you holy. And then the shoes of peace. They're similar to the armor of God's righteousness. They protect your feet and help you stand your ground. Ephesians 2.5 says, It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Let that sink in a little bit. It is not something I have done. It is not something that I can do. I was saved by grace. I was saved by sheer grace alone. God saved me because he loved me, because he wanted to, not because I earned that salvation. I was saved by grace. So I should show grace to those that hurt me. Listen. When you do an accurate assessment of yourself, you will realize how much uh, of a horrible human being you are. And you wouldn't save yourself, honestly, if you were God. But God saved you, and he showed you grace. And as I put on the shoes of peace, I put on the shoes of grace. And I know what grace God showed me. And then I look at you, and I should show you grace as well. Listen, you want to you wanna stop an argument? You want to stop a fight? Seriously, in the heat of the moment, start telling each other about Jesus. I'm telling you. Just as you are in the heat of the moment, start talking about Jesus. Start telling about, talking about Jesus' grace, the cross. <laughs> I think it's going to be an awkward uh, gospel presentation but it will totally get rid of your fight and then there's shield of faith the shield protects our whole bodies from more than brutal attacks it is something that satan uses to make you doubt the truth the truth is you were saved by grace god sees you as righteous and there's nothing that you can do to earn heaven so at the same time the word of god says that he is faithful that he will finish his work that he started. He will finish his work that he started on you. And honestly, we come to God and we're like, God, I'm so grateful that you will finish your work on me. One day I will be perfect. Not just positionally, but just perfect overall. I know he will finish his work in me. And I constantly remind God that I'm the work in progress, right? I'm, I'm just this work. I, I need a lot of work. We forget that God works on my, my neighbor, on my wife, on my kids, on my coworkers. He's working on them too. And the shield of faith is not just believing that God will finish his work on me. But so God will also finish his work on you. I need to believe that, that you are also work in progress. So have faith that Christ will finish his work in you and he will finish the work on the believer that you are angry at. And then finally, there's helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. The helmet of salvation is faith in truth about your salvation. It is the scriptures that tell us we are saved and how we are saved. Memorize them. You want to know how to put on the helmet of salvation? Memorize every scripture about salvation, literally. Memorize that and believe it now. Seriously, it will protect your mind, right? Your mind will be occupied with God's promises. So protect your mind with the promises of God when it comes to salvation. And so those are all the defensive weapons. And we have one offensive weapon that is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. How do we use that? It's interesting, when Jesus was taken to the desert and he was uh, tempted by the devil, Jesus' response to every temptation was, what, what was it, do you know? Get behind me, but it is what? It is written. 
right? It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Listen, you can hold that Bible all you want and you can, you know, you can uh, pray with it, uh, open it up, you can pray with it and it's not going to do you any good. Do you know what's in the Bible? Do you know what's in the Word of God? Do you know what the Word of God says against this situation and against that situation? Do you know what the, God, the Word of God says about your spiritual condition? Do you know what the Word of God says about His grace? Do you know what the Word of God says about His promises? Do you know those things? If you don't know those things, Christian, I pity you. I want to say that. Please, you have the Bible, read it and learn it because this is what you can use when Satan is attacking you. And at the same time, when there is a confrontation between you and the loved one, between you and the friend, you can also open up the scripture and read the scripture and follow the direction that the scripture has for you when it comes to confrontation. You can use that sword against that, that unseen enemy. He is afraid of the word of God. And when Jesus says, it is written, and he says, get behind me, Satan could not stand that sword anymore. So, so he left. And we can use the truth, not only to defend ourselves, but also to attack, to free others from the lies of Satan. And so let us use the word of God to encourage one another and to build each other up. Let's use that sword to encourage one another and to build each other up. And so when we look at the context of the, the last half of Ephesians, he's talking about relationships. And what Paul is saying, relationships are hard. Unity is hard. And what Satan hates is unity in the church and the family and in relationships. So he wants to sabotage it all. He wants to destroy it all. And so put on arms. Put on the armor of God and fight for this unity. So every day I get up. And I look at the spiritual mirror, the word of God, I, I put on my armor. When I put on my armor, I begin to see others through God's truth. I will no longer see them as enemies. I will focus on the real enemy. I will learn to love. I will learn to forgive. I will learn to give grace to those that need it because it was shown to me through the cross of Jesus Christ. And Paul kind of caps this off, and I'm just going to finish it with this verse too. It's Ephesians 6, 18, which I don't have in the slides. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Oh, good, it's here. Thanks. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. I want to end with a question. Since we talked about relationships, since we talked about family, working situation, friends, whatever it is, church family, who do you need to pray for? Who is that person that you really need to pray for now? Who are you arguing with? Who are you fighting? Where is that, that bitter relationship? Who do you need to pray for? I will have you bow your heads. And as worship team comes up here, we're just going to take a few seconds and let this sink in just a little bit. Maybe you are in disagreement with someone. Maybe uh, your feelings are hurt. Maybe you have hurt somebody's feelings. Maybe um, there's just like um, tough relationship in marriage or uh, between kids uh, and parents. Whatever, whichever situation you're in right now, would you pray for that person as I pray? Would you pray for those people? God teaches to put on your armor every day. Because when I put on my armor, every armor has an inscription, saved by grace, holy, 
promises of God. And when I look at that, God, I have no choice but to just drop to my knees and worship you for who you are. I don't deserve grace, yet you've given it to me. I don't deserve hope, yet you've given it to me. I'm not a good person, yet you give me your righteousness, your holiness. I don't deserve any good promises. I just deserve a promise of hell, yet you give me promise of eternal life. Yet you give me promise that you will finish your work that you've started on me. Lord, I don't deserve grace, yet you give it to me every single day. So, Lord, as I put on that armor every morning, I pray that I would learn to give grace to people around me. I pray that I would view the, my believing family of Christ as holy as well. I pray that I would never belittle them or condemn them in any way. God, I pray that I would never use the sword of God to hurt my fellow brother or sister. I pray that I would never shift my focus from the real enemy. I pray that I would never ever see my fellow believer as my enemy, Lord. But I would always see them as a human being just like me who is saved by grace and work in progress. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This next song, I want to focus on the lines, When I doubt it, Lord, remind me.